Hello and welcome again to my physical science online lecture video series. In today's video I wanted to introduce the topic of thermodynamics and to talk about um, part, part of this topic. It's a, a broad enough topic that I'm afraid I can't cover the whole introduction in just one video. Um, so call this introduction part one to the topic of thermodynamics. And what I want to talk about in today's video about thermodynamics is specifically um, heat and temperature. And um, thermodynamics itself is a, a very broad field. Um, it is its own um, basically field within both physics and chemistry. Uh, chemists usually uh, learn it in what's called the physical chemistry courses. Uh, in physics, we usually take a course called thermodynamics and maybe a second course called more thermodynamics or advanced thermodynamics or statistical mechanics or so on. So um, what I want to talk about, as I said, was temperature and heat. And, and I mentioned heat in my previous lecture. Um, I basically treated it as energy that is lost to the system. And, and in fact, heat is a type of energy. Uh, usually it's the energy that is transferred from a hot object to a cold object, although as I showed, in, or as I mentioned in the last uh, video, that's not always necessarily the case. For example, you can heat up a drill bit and a piece of wood by drilling a hole in a piece of wood very quickly. Um, neither object started off hot, both may end up relatively hot. Um, so, but but in order to really get what heat is in, in the context of temperature, it's worth first defining what temperature is. And to do that, I have a little demo of sorts, um, basically a half-eaten can of peanuts or jar of peanuts. And what I'm going to do with this jar is I'm going to shake this jar back and forth a bit and we'll look and see what the peanuts do when I do that and look both at the peanuts that are towards the top and look at the ones that are towards the bottom sorry the label maybe is in the way um, but you know I just love having the nutrition facts on my snacks <laughs> um, in any case watch what happens to the peanuts they're initially just below the level of this label so Okay, so I've shaken the peanuts up and you've seen that quite a few of them stay towards the bottom of the jar. They don't seem to be moving very much. There's a few towards the top, mostly towards the surface, that tend to move around a little bit. Um, it's not a perfect analogy to what happens in, for example, a gas where everything is sort of free to move about, but it's a decent analogy to even, say, a liquid. Uh, basically, if I wanted to ask about the speed of a peanut in here, if I wanted to ask about the energy of a peanut in here, not every peanut has the same energy or the same speed, even though the whole jar is being sh uh, shook or shaken. It's being shaken the same. Um, there's a few peanuts that tend to rattle around a lot towards the top. There's a lot of peanuts towards the bottom that tend not to move a whole lot relative to the jar. Um, so if I want to ask about the speed, maybe the, the real thing that I want to ask about is the kinetic energy of a peanut. And again, that's not the same for all peanuts. Um, but I can, for example, take an average kinetic energy for the peanuts. Um, so that may seem sort of easier said than done uh, in the context of peanuts, but in the context of a gas, it is 
relatively easy to take the average uh, kinetic energy. You use something like this, a thermometer. Uh, so this thermometer measures the uh, temperature of the air in the room, or if I submerge it in water or whatever, it'll measure whatever temperature you want. You know, measure the temperature inside my hand. Uh, I'm not going to put it in my mouth. I don't know where this thing's been, actually. But, um, so on. So I just stuck it in my hand and warmed it a little bit. It's now 29 degrees uh, Celsius. And, uh, Incidentally, you may have noticed that there are two uh, temperatures that this thing, if I can get it aligned correctly, can measure in. There's degrees Fahrenheit and there's degrees Celsius. So the uh, units that go with temperature, therefore, are Fahrenheit and Celsius and actually the correct one for physics use for, for figuring out energies is Kelvin. Um, if you want to get from Fahrenheit to Celsius or Celsius to Fahrenheit, um, a, a change in of temperature of 1 degree Celsius is equal to a change of 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, 0 Celsius is uh, freezing for water. 32 Fahrenheit is freezing for water, so you can get the conversion that way. Um, the more interesting thing to do, since we can measure the temperature in Celsius, is how to convert it to Kelvin. And the answer is that it's actually very straightforward. Uh, change of temperature of 1 Celsius is equal to a change of 1, temp of one uh, Kelvin. And 0 degrees Celsius is equal to 273 Kelvin. Kelvin is basically set so that the zero on its scale is the lowest temperature, uh, what we think is the lowest temperature that something can be. Um, it's sort of the lower limit for temperature. Um, so zero degrees Celsius is equal to 273 Kelvin. It's also uh, one degree Celsius is equal to 274 Kelvin. Two degrees Celsius is 275 Kelvin and so on. Um, to get from temperature to energy, though, what we do is we take the temperature of the object, we put it in Kelvin, and we multiply that number by 3 halves. So 3 halves times the temperature in Kelvin, and then we need a conversion factor to get from Kelvin to joules. And that conversion factor is called Boltzmann's constant. Uh, sometimes it's represented by a lowercase k, sometimes a lowercase k with a subscript of a b. In any case, Boltzmann's constant is a fundamental universal constant. It's approximately equal to 1.380 times 10 to the minus 23 joules per Kelvin. Excuse me, that's 1.3806488 times 10 to the minus 23 joules per Kelvin. So if you want to know what is the average kinetic energy of a molecule in the thing whose temperature you just measured, multiply by 3 halves times the temperature times this Boltzmann's constant. Um, from there you can actually get the uh, average of the squares of the speeds of the molecules, um, which is because the average kinetic energy should equal one-half times m, the mass of a molecule, times the average of the squares of the speeds of the molecules. Um, notice, there's a note that there's a difference between the average of the squares of the speeds and the square of the average of the speeds. And you can, sh you know, simple demo to show this to yourself is pick three numbers. Uh, let's say your numbers are 1, 2, and 3. Now find the average of these three numbers. That number it should be 2. Square it. That's 4. On the other hand, if you square each number first and then find their averages, you're no longer going to get 4. In fact, you're going to get 1 plus 9 plus 4, which is 14, and then divide that by 3. 
now you're looking at four and two thirds. So you're not getting the same number for both. So the thing that temperature gives, if you want to convert to speed, is it gives the average of the squares of the speeds. Um, temperature then is related to heat, um, where heat is sort of energy transferred. Usually it's called energy transferred between a high temperature object and a low temperature object, although as I mentioned it's not always the case that that is so. Um, if you have a, um, let's say you want to figure out how much energy you've transferred to some object. Well you need to know what the ob how much uh, mass the object has, so how much stuff is there to heat. Uh, you need to know what's the temperature change for the object, assuming no phase changes. And you need to know how um, efficiently a heat is transferred into change in temperature for that object. And that's called the specific heat capacity or specific heat of an object. Um, the specific heat of water, for example, is 4,800, excuse me, 4,186 joules per kilogram per Kelvin, or same thing in joules per kilogram per Celsius. So 4,186. Uh, by the way, the alternative unit for heat is calories. I prefer joules because it's the same unit we've been using for energy, but in terms of calories, Water is specific heat of one calorie, uh, excuse me, 1,000 calories per, uh, excuse me, 1,000 calories per kilogram Kelvin. And so let's say you have one kilogram of water and you heat it from 10 degrees Celsius to 20 degrees Celsius. So you have one kilogram of water, you have 10 degrees of temperature change the amount of heat you need for that is 4,186 joules per kilogram Kelvin times one kilogram. So that gives me 4,186 joules per Kelvin or per Celsius times 10 Celsius. So that gives us a total of 41,860 joules that we needed to raise the temperature of the water by so much. Um, so what if there are phase changes? Um, that's sort of the last topic of the day. Uh, phase change means you go from solid to liquid or liquid to gas or vice versa or you can ionize something or you can go from uh, gas straight to a solid or you can go from a solid straight to a gas, uh, etc. Um, the simple phase changes are basically from a uh, solid to a liquid melting or liquid to solid freezing and from uh, liquid to gas which is uh, boiling or vaporizing and from uh, gas back to liquid which is condensing and um, basically what what you do to handle those is that there's what's called a latent heat. So there's a latent heat of fusion, which is the heat to go from solid to liquid. Um, and then there's a latent heat of vaporization, uh, which is to go from liquid to gas. And those are typically um, given in units of, uh, for example, you can do like a kilo calorie per kilogram or a joule per kilogram. Basically 4.186 joules equals one calorie. And so for example with water it takes 80 kilocalories per kilogram to uh, melt water and it takes 540 kilocalories per kilogram to vaporize water. And so that's a measure of uh, per kilogram, how much energy does that phase change take? That's all I've got time for today. Um, so thanks for watching, and I hope you found this video uh, helpful.